All right, so everyone can see this image here. Did anyone else here see this in the last week or so? It was on a lot of websites. This was taken. Um, well, people can see what this is, right? Saturn. Yeah, this is Saturn. These are the rings. And I think this is an image which captures or begins to capture effectively the perspective that people need to have now. This was taken by the spacecraft Cassini. And obviously Saturn is in the picture. Do people know what this is? No. That, in fact, is Earth. So we're getting a very particular type of view of Earth, which we haven't had before. But it looks, from this perspective, like the way Mars looks to us when we look up into the sky, the way that most stars look when we look up into the sky. And from this perspective, I mean, the great island of Manhattan is but a fraction of a, a pixel. Yeah. <laughs> now you have to think in terms of how many of these types of spots do we see when we look up into the sky at night now? Yeah, okay, maybe, okay, maybe get outside the city a little bit. But you have to think, what other potential? Because we, from this perspective, can look down and say, oh, that's Earth, and we have some idea of maybe the history of Earth, life on Earth, we know about the cities on Earth, people on Earth. But now, how much of that kind of potential exists whenever we then, from Earth, look out into the rest of the galaxy? to other galaxies. I mean, there's, it's estimated that in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, there are about 300 billion stars just in our galaxy. 300 billion. That's about 40 stars for every person on Earth. Now, each of those stars, maybe not every single one, but most of them, they've now been able to determine have some type of planetary system associated with them. So 300 billion stars, each possibly with its own planetary system, with anywhere from three, five, eight, how many ever planets. So now you're starting to think possibly up into the trillions in terms of number of planets that exist just in our galaxy. And if you look at some of these images that Hubble has taken where these wide view images where you're actually seeing in the pictures hundreds, but now it's projected there are actually billions then of galaxies. So you've got billions of galaxies, each of which itself has hundreds of billions of stars, which then each of those hundreds of billions of stars potentially have, you know, a handful of planets. You think that's the kind of universe that we live in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry. Okay. People can see that. Each of those dots is actually a galaxy. <laughs> so, and again, each of those galaxies, hundreds of billions of stars. So, yeah, you can imagine that's, you know, there's a lot of potential out there. <laughs> in the universe. Now, the unique thing is that despite, on the one hand, what might seem like, you know, the Carl Sagan perspective, oh, we're just this tiny little speck in the universe, and who are we to think that we're anything important? Uh, who are we to think that this little blue marble, as he coined the term, really has any significance in the grandeur of it all? Yeah, Carl Sagan's got, he's, you know, even though he's sort of, a lot of people think, well, he popularized the idea of astronomy and whatnot, his philosophical spin on it is actually very pessimistic and very little, 
which, you know, you could have if you just sort of say, oh, I'm just little me on this planet. Now you're thinking billions, trillions of stars. How significant is that actually? But now we think about, well, but yet here we are able to see from the outside ourselves. Right? Nothing else is able to do that. No other life that we know of, at least up to this point, is able to then get this kind of a perspective. To sort of not only, on the one hand, sort of see yourself inside this vast thing, but then invert it and actually realize that that whole vastness of trillions, quadrillions of stars and galaxies and what have you can all actually be contained or conceptualized in the single mind. And this is something, for just as a reference, if people, um, Friedrich Schiller has an essay called The Aesthetical Estimation of Magnitude, where he plays around with this kind of a concept of, you know, mankind often is sort of caught between, flip-flops between this sort of state where you're, you're inspired or you're, you know, there's a certain sense of awe when you're confronted with something like a giant mountain or an army of soldiers. And you sort of, on the one hand, you feel little relative to this mass of magnitude until you step back for a second and realize actually, uniquely to the human mind, that you can actually now grasp that whole mass of magnitude as a single one in the mind. That there's something unique about the human mind which is able to get outside of the vastness of things and understand that which bounds it, to contain the principle of the bounded principle behind the process. So I think this is, this is a great image to see Earth as others might see us, so to speak. So with this in mind, I want to now go into a little bit of, from this perspective, some of what Mr. LaRouche has been touching on. He's getting back to it. He had emphasized it a lot going back a couple years ago. And now he's getting, again, focusing more on developing this kind of conception for people. Of now starting to think about, as was referenced, the idea of how do you shape the entire planet? How do you change the planet? How do we change our own perspective of what it means to be on this planet? And understand the real history of it and what we as human beings on Earth face and understand the history of what the planet has gone through and the kinds of dynamic changes that are involved. So I'm just going to play through this video clip. Um, it doesn't have the sound with it, but I'll kind of narrate a bit what's, what we're seeing here. All right, so this is, um, let's see where this comes from. Okay, so first off, this is, I th actually, I think this will come up again in the right context. Okay, so this initially, this is a curve that was sort of a generic curve that's based off of this, um, this data of what's known as biodiversity. So this is going back 350 some million years where they're able to measure the biodiversity largely based in the ocean because that's where we have the best preserved um, fossils. So they can, there was a comp, they compiled a vast amount of data based off of research over dozens of years. And so what you're seeing here is this, this curve is the rise and fall, but what you see is an overall trend of rise in biodiversity, meaning this is the number of different genera, which is a classification of how you classify forms of life, that have existed over 350 million years on Earth. That's as far back as we can really accurately date things or, you know, have some confidence that we have the whole picture, so to speak. Now, the one thing to notice is that it is jagged, it goes up and down, but the overall trend throughout the history of life on the planet has been towards an overall increase of biodiversity. 
meaning different types of creatures, right? Like, you know, rabbits versus monkeys or this kind of thing. So the overall trend has been an, an increase in biodiversity. Life is becoming more complex, more robust on the planet. Now from this data, this we'll get to next, they were able to extract out of the overall trend certain embedded cycles within this biodiversity. And this, I think, will be the, the next image that comes up. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, 542 million years. That's the, the span we're dealing with. So out of this overall trend, they were able to extract a different trend, which is this 62 million year biodiversity cycle, as it's known. So what this is, is that every 62 million years, roughly, the biodiversity, in terms of the number of different types of creatures that are on the planet, goes through this up and down process. It'll rise and then dip, and then rise and then dip. So from peak to peak here is about roughly 62 million years. So they were able to extract this cycle out of the overall cycle of biodiversity. So every 62 million years we go through some cycle of rise and fall, rise and fall of biodiversity. Yeah, new, new species are coming into existence, other ones are dying off, and, and the total number kind of rises and falls in this cyclical type of fashion. Yeah. That's what we're going to get into right now. That's, that became the question because I mean, that's a large cycle. And you have to think something of that scope wouldn't have an internal driver to it. Right? There's nothing internal to the planet which seems to have a 62 million year cycle to it. So you have to look outside and say, well, is there something of which we're a part of which could contain something of that scale of 62 million years. And so this is what was then proposed by another set of researchers that somehow this must be connected to the activity of the galaxy. Some relationship of Earth to processes occurring at least on a galactic scale. And so they, they looked at this and the hypothesis that was put forward, let me see if it comes up here, was it had to do with the fact that, you know, we, people have seen images of things like uh, spiral galaxies, right? Our galaxy is what's known as a spiral galaxy. So it has these different arms, these sort of logarithmic spiral arms. And there's some debate, they're not even sure exactly how many the Earth has, if it's, uh, if it's four or eight. But we know we, have, we live in some sort of a spiral galactic structure. But it's not static. Right? It's not like a static pinwheel or something. Everything, all the stars within that spiral galaxy are all moving, are all rotating around the center. And the thing that, so the arms themselves, and this is what they, they came up with, that the arms, and the arms themselves are always changing in their composition. But Earth, for example, and I, I forget, I think it's about 144 million years it takes for the Earth, I think that's it, for the Earth to take one um, orbit around the galaxy, you know, to return back to the same place. So the Earth is constantly rotating, is moving. The Sun, our solar system, like all stars, is moving around towards the outer edge, around the center, orbiting around the galaxy. But it's not simply just orbiting, it's also bobbing up and down. So as it's moving around the center, it's also bobbing down below the disk, so it's a spiral disk, so it's sort of bobbing down below the disk and then rising up and then bobbing down and then rising up and passing through the disk as it does that. And the best calculations at this point are that, is that that cycle of bobbing up and down is roughly in the 60 some million year range, you know, give or take a couple of million. And so they started to put this correlation together to say, well, perhaps there's a correlation between the bobbing up and down 
of our solar system through the galaxy and this rise and fall in biodiversity. That somehow the relationship of our movement through the galaxy is playing a very strong role in determining life on Earth. That life on Earth, the kinds of life on Earth, the amount of life on Earth is very strongly connected to processes that are occurring on a galactic scale. Then the question became, well, why is it 62? Since that's only the peaks, why wouldn't it be every 30-something, as you say, passing through, whenever it might seem like there'd be a stronger effect because you're passing through the galaxy towards a denser part of it? So what was determined and developed was that the reason why it was 62 at the peaks and seemingly always occurred whenever the Earth or the solar system is at the northern peak of this cycle is because our galaxy itself is also moving and it's moving towards what's known as the Virgo cluster which is a cluster of stars and nebula and whatnot which produces a lot of cosmic radiation high intensity cosmic radiation and so the idea was as we're moving into this Virgo cluster is creating a certain kind of shock front which is then accelerating driving an increased amount of cosmic radiation towards the towards our galaxy and now we would have greater exposure to that radiation as we were towards the northern half of of the galaxy as we were in the upward trend of this of this movement and so there's a lot of strong evidence that that's so one aspect of what's driving biodiversity is our not even just our galaxy but then our galaxy's relationship to other star structures the Virgo cluster and you know cosmic radiation this is just another image of another aspect which plays a role in life on Earth. This is something which is developed by uh, a fellow named uh, Svensmark and another guy, Shaviv, who he works with, who are looking at some of the things like the Ice Age cycles. You know, the fact that you get these cycles of very deep, cold periods, you know, within interglacials, which we're in now. We're actually in an interglacial. Yeah. As far, yeah, we're not, we're not, no, yeah, that's not known. Which, I mean, that brings up an interesting question, which is why we'd like to get stuff out into other galaxies because it's just hard to make those kind of measurements from here. And the fact is, one, we don't know what the cycle of life is on other galaxies. Here, we're able to at least have some sense of some cycle of rise and fall of biodiversity, and we're able to make some calculations and determinations of our own movement through our galaxy. Now the other movement I mentioned is the movement just through the disk itself in and out of these spiral arms. And so one of the theories put forward by Svensmark and Shaviv is that one of the things that drives the ice ages is whenever we're in the spiral arm we have a much more uh, we have an increased exposure again to other forms of cosmic radiation because we're near more stars, there's more nebular explosions, this kind of thing. And that cosmic radiation has the ability to do a kind of cloud seeding. So whenever there's more intense cosmic radiation hitting the planet, you're going to get increased cloud cover. And if that occurs for prolonged extended periods of time, you're going to get a cooling effect. And so he did some also some correlations and saw that there's a definite correlation to increase cosmic radiation. The timing of the ice ages seems to correspond with when we think we've been in these spiral arms, whereas warm other periods seem to correlate when we're out of it. And so again, another theory is being put forward as to the role of galactic processes and cosmic radiation to driving large cycles of activity here on Earth. And this, here's an image depicting, uh, I think this, I'm not sure if that might be the cat's eye nebula or something. But these nebula are the real main source of cosmic radiation. Things like the crab nebula, the, co the cat's eye nebula. These are whenever stars go supernova and they go through this process of transformation. You know, they like to say it's the death of a star. I think it's actually more of the birth of a, a nebula because these things are very fantastic and highly structured things that occur, that the source of this cosmic radiation, much of it are these, 
these nebular transformations. And so here's just a, a depiction of, now you can see, here's, here's the biodiversity curve, this black one. The red is, would be, correlate to the curve of the movement through the galaxy. And you can kind of see that where you've got the dips in biodiversity tends to correspond with whenever you would have the peak on the northern side of the galactic cycle. So you see these dips. That the dips in biodiversity correspond with the peaks on the northern hemisphere of our galaxy. And vice versa, whenever you've got peaks in increase in biodiversity, it tends to correspond with the dips in, in our movement through the galaxy. Yeah? Also one of the Cambrian in the beginning? Was there one there? Um, I'm not sure. I, don't, I think that's sort of a fuzzy area in terms of our, our fossil records. But now what you've also got here, what's depicted with these, are the so-called Big Five extinctions. I think the one most people are familiar with is the most recent one, 65 some million years ago, with the dinosaurs, the extinction of the dinosaurs, which, you know, if you think about it, they were the biggest, baddest thing to ever walk the planet. I mean, nothing was more ferocious and large and seemingly well-adjusted to life on the planet. But yet, they're gone, extinct. As have about 97% of all species that have ever existed have gone extinct. I mean, that's the history of life on this planet, is that things go extinct. Things get wiped out en masse. Now, the interesting thing, and this might have something to do with some of the wild weather or just a foretaste of the kind of direction that we're going in, is that, in fact, we currently are on one of these upward swings. I mean, you think about it, the dinosaurs, they went extinct 62, 65 million years ago. These cycles every 62 million years, we're sort of, in terms of relative to um, you know, this model, we're kind of coming up out of the plane towards the northern region of our galaxy, which poses all kinds of interesting questions, such as, how the hell do we keep ourselves from going extinct if, in fact, this is the kind of process that we're dealing with? And that brings us directly to really the kind of economic perspective that we need to have. When we start thinking long term about what really does it mean to have an economy for survival. And this is something that Mr. LaRouche, uh, he posed this. I think actually whenever he was in prison, he had a book called The Science of Christian Economy. And uh, I think one of the essays is called Project A. But he made this distinction between momentary and long-term survival. You know, momentary survival is, you know, someone saves you from drowning. Or, you know, you're starving, you happen to find a burger in the trash or something like that. I mean, there's, there's that kind of survival. But then there's the question of, okay... What about whenever you're seemingly everything's going okay, as it had for the dinosaurs and others? How do you actually know and forecast where you're going and consequently what you need to do to ensure real long-term survival? And really, how does the human species survive? And that becomes the real question. How do we ensure long-term survival? Because the kinds of events in terms of, you know, we're talking on a, a geological time scale, the kinds of processes that wipe, that cause these mass extinctions throughout history, like the dinosaurs and the four previous ones, those are cyclical type of events. They're events which occur that we know have occurred more than one time. I mean, with the dinosaurs, for example, it was the massive asteroid that hit off the, the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico that you know, was at least one of the drivers, which it wasn't just the blast, it was that it sent up a, a lot of debris and smoke and blocked out the sun. Uh, there's a lot of evidence this, that this also went along with some massive volcanic eruptions. 
Some of the other extinctions were driven by things like tectonic changes, which change, which not only create a certain kind of, uh, you know, instability in the crust, but also changes ocean currents. You know, one of the big drivers of climate change was whenever you had the, uh, with the peninsula that connects North and South America, when that um, finally came together, closed, it changed all the ocean currents on the planet, which changed, you know, where warm water and cold water went, which actually was one of the drivers for uh, one of the ice ages, or at least played a role in it. Um, the ice ages themselves, we know those are cyclical. There's a certain cyclical characteristic to them, which is associated with, you know, possibly the movement through the galaxy, but then also there's this stuff known as the Milenkovitch cycles, which deal with changes in just our own orbit, the contraction and expanding of our own orbit. It changes the precession of the equinox, which is the changing of our axis and orientation to the sun. That that has a cyclical character to it. And that seems to correspond with these ice ages and different amounts of radiation we get from the sun. So we know these kinds of cyclical processes happen. And something is going to happen again. Right, whether it's going to be a massive comet or asteroid that hits, or whether it's going to be an ice age, or it's going to be you know, even more extreme weather like we're starting to see now. The planet changes. That's just reality. The climate changes. It gets hotter, it gets colder. It gets really hot, it can get really damn cold. Things change. And these are processes which are driven on a galactic scale. So we know that's our future. We know that's the future of the planet. The question is, can we do anything about it? And even beyond that, if we start to think even further out in terms of billions of years, another thing we know is that our own sun has a finite lifespan to it. The sun is not going to be around forever. It's going to go through some sort of, not supernova, it's probably not the type of star to do that, but it'll go through a kind of red giant phase where it will start to use up its fuel that's driving its fusion process and will start to expand. And in that expansion, it's going to gobble up everything in the solar system and burn it to a crisp. Which means, you know, we have to figure out, we've got a couple billion years, hopefully, at least to figure out not only how do we defend Earth from cosmic phenomena, but now we have to think about how the hell do we get out of this solar system and into a safer region. And how do we know what characterizes a safer region? You know, how do we determine what's a habitable place for mankind? And so these become the big types of economic questions. And in fact, it's by taking on those types of questions that will really be the driver for getting out of the current economic crisis. So let's give some examples of what we're looking at, others are starting to play with, but it's not nearly enough. So there is a policy known as the strategic defense of Earth. This was something that in name, I think was at least the first I heard it was, um, I think it was, uh, was it Makarov who put this out about two years ago. He was a Russian at the time, I think he was the, I want to say the deputy minister of defense or something in Russia. But he had, he had said we need a common approach between the United States and Russia to work together for a strategic defense of Earth. Yeah, oh yeah, it's Rogozin. Yeah, this is Rogozin who said this. Now the choice of that terminology is very specific and I would think intentional. Because this was what the title of the policy that was adopted by the Reagan administration based off of what LaRouche had been promoting, and what became known as the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which was the idea that instead of this insane doctrine of mutually assured destruction, which is a self-driven extinction policy, instead of the idea that, well, the thing that's going to keep us safe is the fact that we don't think either side is so crazy as to <laughs> launch a nuclear war, but yet, both sides are also then secretly trying to figure out, what if we did launch nuclear war? Is there a way we could gain a first strike advantage and knock out the enemy and win? 
So it, was, it really was the mad doctrine. It was insane. And so the SDI was, okay, let's eliminate this mad doctrine. Let's have the United States and the then Soviet Union collaborate in developing front-end technology, beam weapon technology, so X-ray beam technology, um, particle beam technology, high energy beam weapon technology that would be able to shoot down any missiles and, you know, in rapid succession to where you could have a relatively, you know, once it was developed, it would become a relatively low cost system in terms of the cost per shot because, you know, it's a lot cheaper for a laser shot than it is for a missile. So a relatively low cost defense system that would actually make it more advantageous to invest and develop the defenses than it would the, um, the offensive um, missile technology. And that in doing that, one, you'd bring a collaboration between the U.S. and the Soviets. You'd create the potential to, to eliminate the idea of, of nuclear warfare. But then in the long term, you'd be developing new technologies that would drive an economic revolution in terms of what those lasers could do for cutting processes, for machining, for um, you know, manufacturing. Uh, the development, what that would do in leading towards the development of fusion. Now, this is why it was the Fusion Energy Foundation, which was the driver behind this policy. Because it was recognized that these technologies would be, would sort of be the, the, uh, the stepping stone or be sort of the pathway towards really the development of, of viable fusion technology, fusion energy development. And so this would spin off and transform the economy of the world. You know, water desalination would be no problem. You start to move towards things like um, transmutation, where you can use these hot plasmas, very hot plasmas, where you can start to transmute elements from one element into another, which is, you know, that's pretty phenomenal. Now you're starting to do the kinds of things that are occurring within the cores of a, of a star. And there's actually lasers that have been developed now where they've been able to demonstrate this capability, these petawatt lasers where they've transformed gold into platinum, for example. Um, so there would be that. There would also be using these plasmas for, um, um, you can do a recycling of what some call nuclear waste, what the Japanese used to call a valuable resource, because they recognize whenever you know, a, a nuclear power plant is going through a nuclear burn, it's not only are you having nuclear decay of the, the uh, whatever it is, plutonium or uranium, whatever they're using, it's also in the process creating virtually the whole spectrum of the periodic table, but in very trace amounts. But if you're able to run this stuff through, a, through these plasmas, through what's known as a fusion torch, a plasma torch, and you use certain kinds of electromagnetic techniques and extraction, you can start to extract all these scarce materials out of, out of the... Uh, the nuclear waste or the nuclear resource. And so there's a, there's a whole vast domain of different types of technologies and benefits that would come out of this, or would have come out of, the advances from the SDI. But as we know, it was killed. Lynn, many of his collaborators were framed up, jailed, and you know, there's a massive attack on that kind of policy, that kind of outlook. And, I mean, that really was, aside from what you had with Kennedy, that was the last real gasp of hope towards a bright future that we had. And, you know, it's all been, you know, downhill, so to speak, since then. So now the SDE is put forward with that specific language, that specific strategic defense perspective, with the idea, and this is what we've been developing, this now can be the driver for economic progress is to now get back to the idea of, okay, the U.S., Russia, other nations, China, uh, India, could be collaborating now with the common aim of defending mankind from extinction. Both, and you know, I mean, we saw kind of the potential, what was it, whenever uh, the comet, the, the, the asteroid that blew up over the skies in, in Russia several months back. I mean, that was just... That was a small little fragment, but, you know, there's, it's, we know things are out there that could, you know, knock out 
the five boroughs, you know, and these are, you know, these are common, you know, relatively common events. And we're not really that good at forecasting when the next thing's going to hit either. So you develop the technologies for one searching out these objects and then figuring out how to defend yourself from them. Whether, and ultimately the best thing would be to develop some sort of, uh, whether deployed from Mars or elsewhere, some sort of beam or combination beam nuclear explosion type of technologies that would be able to deflect these things, destroy them, and to where you'd be able to act within a, a, you know, a short period of time. Because a lot of times, again, you don't always know when the next thing is coming. I mean, for example, there was the uh, Tungusta event, and this was, I'm trying to think the year on this, like maybe 1918. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, this was in Russia, in Siberia, where some sort of asteroid hit, and, I mean, it leveled. It had the power of multiple atomic bombs. Now, fortunately, it hit in an area which was... For no people, but I mean, if you, they have images, I mean, it just leveled for miles around trees and just the whole area. Something like that hits Manhattan or L.A. or Chicago or something like that. You're talking millions of lives lost. Yeah. The Tunguska event presumably was a lot smaller than the one that led to the disaster. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was much, much smaller than that. Is there a theory about the uh, cyclical nature of the density of asteroids? coming in some proximity to, to Earth? Is there any, are there any theories that you know? No, I mean, there's some statistical correlations that they have out there about how often they occur. In terms of theory, there's certain um, like gravitational tug theory that sometimes from the, the Oort cloud, which is there at the edges of our solar system, you get a uh, perturbing of these objects that are out there whenever because of changes in... Uh, like Jupiter's orbit and this kind of thing. But it's actually, to be honest, very little understood. At this point, well, the best I can come up with is an entirely random event. It cannot be predicted. We don't know. Yeah, right now, basically, yeah, the idea is it's random, but we can have some statistical sense of how often they seem to occur statistically. But as to cause, yeah, it's very little understood. And this is something that we're trying to work on, and people at NASA are also trying to figure out. Which gets at another problem, which is, unfortunately, the quality of education, the, uh, the methodology which is employed in science today hinders a lot of that progress because everything often is reduced just down to statistical correlation to certain kinds of existing mathematical formula as opposed to, say, what you have with Kepler. Where Kepler, I mean, he created a science, he made discoveries for which there were no mathematics. Right? Kepler confronted with paradoxes about the nature of, of Mars, for example, than the whole solar system, generate a hypothesis based off of paradoxes that were presented, experimental paradoxes, a hypothesis which we now know is true, which had predictive capability, but for which there was actually no mathematics at the time that he could use. And he actually put forward what's known as the Kepler challenge for future mathematicians to develop a mathematics that could deal with, for example, elliptical functions. Doesn't uh, NASA have a program right now for, uh, they, they have observation satellites trying to pick this all this stuff up? Yeah, so there's work being done on observation. But one, number one, know that by, it's estimated now because of current budget constraints, that by 2020 we'll probably have half the number of satellites in orbit that we have now. So as we say, we're going to be flying blind through our solar system and galaxy. And two, they're now becoming more and more dependent on private funding. Like there's a group called the B612 Foundation, which is right now the leading private company which is building a telescope to to try to locate more and more of these asteroids. So it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's the asteroid detection in NASA as a whole is suffering f the same fate as everything in the economy, where speculation, Wall Street, money for money's sake has taken precedent over everything, even our own survival.
Well, from our current understanding, yes. But that's not necessarily, just because it's random to us at the moment, doesn't mean it's a random event. And that's why, you know, we have to develop the capability in terms of methodology. That's why Kepler has to be at the core of any kind of education. That's why, the, you know, from Kepler to then Gauss, Riemann, there is, a, there is an arc of thought which really is based on this principle of, the principle of creative discovery beyond the mathematics and beyond your sense impressions. And I mean, you're talking about a, a continuity that goes from, you know, really from Plato through the Renaissance, through people like Cusa. Kepler was a follower of Cusa. You've got Leibniz, who was a follower of of Kepler, up to people like Gauss, Riemann, and then Einstein. Einstein and Planck were explicit. I mean, um, Einstein wrote this beautiful essay commemorating, what was I want to say, the 250th anniversary of the death of Kepler. Uh, my dates aren't always great. But anyways, Einstein, a follower of Kepler. So if you look at actually the people who have made real fundamental discoveries and contributions to mankind, they come out of a very definite tradition. And they're always in this tug of war against, I mean, the quantum era. You've got Planck discovered the quantum. You've got Einstein who discovered um, things like the resolution to the photoelectric effect, predicted and formulated how lasers would be developed. In terms of the actual real, dis you know, and then everyone knows about relativity. So in terms of the actual discoverers of principle, and the ones who made these real contributions, they all come out of this tradition. Then you've got people who try to usurp it like Bohr and um, Heisenberg and others who come along who didn't really make any fundamental discoveries of principle, but latch on to the discoveries and then come up with the mathematics and say, oh, well, forget the real science. Planck and Einstein, they're old fuddy-duddies. They're living in the past. We've got the new truth. And what was their new truth? That actually you can't know truth. That was, yeah, exactly. That was Heisenberg and Bohr. Their thing was that since our ability to perceive something has a certain finite resolution to it, that if you want to look at something at the quantum level, to observe it, you have to interact with it with, with say, light or even electrons. Now, if an electron interacts with something which is also as small as an electron, well, then it's going to disturb it. And so since it's going to disturb it, you can't actually say both simultaneously its position and its momentum because your interaction is going to change one of those two things. So he said, okay, there's a limit to our ability to have perceptual interaction and determinacy about an event. Okay, that's fine. Now, Einstein and others said, well, that just says, okay, there's a limit to our perceptual capability to precisely determine things. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's now unknowable. But for Bohr and, and, and uh, Heisenberg and, and the so-called Copenhagen School and the Copenhagen interpretation, for them, truth is experience. Truth is sense perception. And if there's a limit to sense perception, there's a limit to our ability to know something as true. And that became their fundamental doctrine. And since we've determined this limit in sense perception, we now can say that fundamentally, as far as we're concerned, we'll never be able to know cause beyond this point. All we'll ever have is statistical correlation. All we'll ever have is some level of statistical probability in determining things. Cause, unknowable. Beyond the mathematics beyond this perception, unknowable. And that was the fight. Now, whenever you adopt that, it, it also produces a very kind of pessimistic mentality in science, in the population. Right now, the universe is unknowable, only statistically uh, predictable, probable. You know, it leads to all kinds of wild, crazy things. You know, combine that then with the doctrine of things like the second law of thermodynamics, which says that ultimately the universe is complex and is attached to it as you might be. Your reality is that at some point in the future, the universe as a whole is going to reach heat death. 
It's going to reach a point where all of the structure and organization that you see around you will eventually diffuse out into this cold, zero potential, homogenous soup. Which, you know, at that point, it's like, oh, well, what, am, what is there to live for? So what? Okay, fine. Humanity goes extinct tomorrow or it goes extinct in 10 billion years. In the end, what's it really matter? And that's the kind of mentality which is intentionally put out there. It's politically motivated to push a form of science, to push an ideology, which ultimately enables people to always kind of fall back into some sort of, uh, you know, existential, does, is it really worth it? What really am I doing? Shouldn't I just really just go for the pleasure? It's a lot easier. You know, immortality, eh, sounds nice, but in the end, you know, or you flee into the universe, the material world is all just an illusion, it's all bullshit. I've got to go, you know, into my cave and explore my whatever. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it is kind of a funny thing to think about because on the one hand you could say they're cycles, but on the other hand they're not just cycles. Like right. There's something else going on there. Because it's funny, it's just a funny thing to think about. You know, people say that, you know, there's, um, you know, things, oh, they're always, they always go in cycles, things always go a certain way. You know, people talk about But it's funny because um, I was thinking about this thing that Megan went through on the weekly report where she was going through the um, Mozart Titan Right. And how you end one movement and you think, well, there's a really unambiguous, questionable, unassertive idea. And then in the next movement, bam, th that idea takes over. Sort of like, you know, a few years ago we were fighting for Glass Eagle, and now Glass Eagle is a force of its own. You know, as one said. Right. Um, anyways, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts, because in a certain sense, it almost it makes it. I mean, who could actually understand that other than the human mind? Who could actually act upon that or or play around with that other than the human mind? But it's just interesting because you have these cycles, but yet. There's something else at play. Just, yeah. Just a funny thing yeah, no, that's, and that gets at beyond the fact that there are, there is cyclical activity. But if you look at the process as a whole, it's a developmental process. There is increased biodiversity. The overall cycle is towards increase. But also not just increase, but development, complexity. If you look at life going back to the first little bacteria that were in the ocean who effectively extinguished themselves through their production of oxygen, right? probably the greatest mass extinction that has ever occurred on the planet was several billion years ago with the so-called oxygen crisis. Whenever creatures were spewing out oxygen as waste and effectively choked out themselves and everything else on the planet, because they were unable to deal with oxygen. But out of that, then you had the cyanobacteria somehow emerged out of that as a creature, as a bacteria that could utilize oxygen and pump more of it, transform the planet. Now we had an oxygen atmosphere. We had an ozone layer. We built a defense system against solar radiation so that life could then get more complex, move out of the oceans onto land. You then had to develop more from amphibians than to reptiles and more developed forms of, of plant life and symbiotic relationships between them and different um, structures and um, in their root systems and whatnot. Yeah. So you're saying that overall the biodiversity has gone up. Yeah. Within that, there have been these extinction cycles. Right. So 
But could there be some kind of general principle that says that there has to be the extinction cycles in order for the biodiversity to go up? I mean, you can make that correlation. I think more to the point is that progress is necessary for survival. That in any one of these circumstances, the system as a whole is going through a process of change. You know, the dinosaurs represented an actual evolutionary upshift relative to, say, even just the reptiles. I mean, dinosaurs, there's some evidence that they had some kind of quasi warm blooded characteristics. They had certain kinds of bone and other structures which were more in the direction of mammals than reptiles. And they had become very well adapted to a current phase of the biosphere, of the planet. But the system is always developing. It's always moving forward. Because that gets to the point, the universe itself is not just a statistical being. Right? The universe is not a, a machine in that sense. That it's, it's fixed in terms of its characteristics and its workings, and it just goes through sort of a process of unfolding. But the universe is always changing. It's always developing. It's always becoming more complex, more dynamic, more inner, interwoven. And so life itself has that same characteristic. Now within it, any creature, that's the nature of creatures. They don't, as individual species, they don't necessarily evolve to the next phase, right? You don't have dinosaurs weren't able to step back and say, hey, things are changing. We better, you know, figure out a better way to exist. Maybe we better get smaller, start growing some hair or whatever. But life as a whole, the principle of life did change. It did evolve. It did develop, right? You then out of that extinction, you had this little, you know, what was nothing, a little nothingness running around for a couple million years prior to that extinction. These mammals, all of a sudden, boom, exploded, became the dominant creature. But they became dominant because the whole system changed. Right? Plants went from being dominated by these gymnosperm type of plant life to angiosperms, which are the type of plants that produce fruits and flowers which have a lot of energy contained in them, right? There's a lot of energy in fruit. That became necessary for mammals, which have a very high metabolism relative to reptiles. Reptiles are cold-blooded. They can't live in certain climates. They got to shut down for half the year when it gets cold in certain climates. Mammals, no, they can do that. But it's expensive. They need a lot of fuel. They need a lot of food. That's hard to get whenever you're just trying to live off of ferns. But seeming virtually simultaneously with the evolution and development of mammals, you then had the development of fruits and flowers to fuel those mammals. Almost to the day that flowers came on the scene, bees came on the scene, which play a very necessary role in the pollination process. So you start to see the whole system actually went through this, in a sense, a technological upshift, a revolution. And that the, you know, the characteristics of that revolution are that more work, in a sense, is being done on the planet. More energy from the sun is being transformed into biomass. More soil is being overturned. Seeds are being spread further by mammals because, you know, they eat the berries, they go out and poop deep into the woods. And so the whole system is going through a, an evolution towards complexity, diversity, and intensity of work. This, you know, the biosphere is working harder and more dynamically. Now, that's a lesson that we have to learn as human beings. Because unlike any one of those creatures, we are able to step back and both understand the process that brought us here, but forecast where we're going. And think about what must we do next in order to be part of the process of evolution and development. Now, if we don't move forward ourselves, the universe is moving forward regardless of what we do. It would like our help, and, you know, I mean, this, I think this is really the essence of, uh, you know, the, at least it's probably there in almost all religious doctrine to some extent, that, you know, human beings are in the image of the Creator, in the sense that human beings are capable of not just sort of going along for the ride with the creation and unfolding of the universe, but we can willfully participate in the development 
right? We can bring the biosphere to an even higher level. Think about what Nawapa would do. It would increase the amount of life on the planet. The planet would be more vibrant because of our activity. We can take life to parts of the solar system and universe that have none. Right? So we participate in the development and evolution of life and creativity in the universe. But we have to choose to do that. And to not do that is extinction. Because there is no such thing as simple survival. There is no, oh, let's find the formula. Let's find the formula for success and just do that, you know, as the green movement would have you believe, right? The idea of sustainable development. Sustainable development is the name for death. Because there is no such thing as sustainable development. There's only progress. There's only evolution towards higher states. As we've seen, as we went from steam engines to internal combustion engines, which meant we could go from just locomotives to now with the internal combustion and we could fly. We went from that to chemical propulsion that put us on the moon. We had started to develop nuclear power, which would at least give us an even greater capability for you know, more quicker and, and uh, more often trips to the moon in the, and within the inner solar system. Then you go to fusion. Fusion power, were it to be developed, has the power to put us on Mars in a, ma in a week or so. One gravity acceleration. Each of these represents a higher energy flux density, a new technology, a new form of intensity of fire. Then you get to things like matter-antimatter, which if that were developed, we're talking about being able to, within the course of maybe nine years, traveling at roughly half the speed of light, getting to the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, the Alpha Centauri system. So with each of these evolutionary phases in terms of a technology, in terms of a new power, an energy flux density, we increase then the power of man to go further out into the solar system, into the galaxy, to control even higher energy intensive processes, to the point where we now willfully, as man, start to replicate and create the conditions that otherwise only exist in the center of stars. You know, and then we can start imagining, you know, can we create stars? Can we, you know, control them? What else is there potentially at man's disposal? But that's, I'll get to you in a minute, but that's, that's something we have to now take up as the intention to do so. Because otherwise, you know, as Lynn had been saying, and, you know, there was a thing in the briefing today from, uh, this was an article, uh, yeah, Paul Craig Roberts, just as Lynn has been saying for a couple of years now, commenting on this new doctrine that the U.S. has developed called the air-sea battle where the U.S. is now actively pursuing a doctrine, developing it, that's based on the idea of being able to win a nuclear war against, specifically they're talking about China, but if you look at the kind of encirclement policy we've had towards Russia with the, the positioning of, of uh, missile defense systems, with what's going on in the, in the Middle East region, you know, that's the doctrine among many leading people in the military. Fortunately, that's not the mentality of people like Dempsey, the head of the Joint Chiefs, but this is a doctrine being developed to say, can we win a nuclear war? And so there's an article that's in our briefing today from, uh, I forget where he wrote this, op-ed, uh, this is called op-ed news. Anyways, where he talks about this air-sea battle and the fact that there is now a push for a policy to win a nuclear war against China and others. And what Mr. LaRouche said, his comments on it are, he said, LaRouche warned on being informed of the Roberts article, that the world is facing precisely such a showdown sometime possibly between September and Christmas of this year, when the transatlantic financial system is expected to blow apart, driving factions within the Anglo-Dutch Empire to seriously contemplate just such a thermonuclear first strike. And he says the target would not be simply China or Russia per se, 
but would aim instead at wiping out 80% of the human race worldwide. Because that's the thing, a lot of this is being driven by this insane mentality, you know, typical of the royal family and their ilk, which say, hey, it's too many people, it's too hard to control so many people, they use resources, they want freedom, they want control. We need to get the population down to a much more manageable number. You know, preferably, yeah, one billion. If we can get down to one billion, we can manage one billion. War might be a way to do it. Disease might be a way to do it. Environmentalism is their way to do it. Create the conditions where everyone accepts technologies which aren't capable of producing the kinds of industry needed to support seven plus billion people. Get people to adopt the types of policies which only could support a billion people. And the process of weeding out yeah, you know, as Bertrand Russell said, it'll be unpleasant, but what of it? And he said, really high-minded people don't, you know, don't mind these kinds of things. And so that's, you know, that's the danger we face. We face a real possibility of extinction now through the economic collapse, through the threat of war, through the effects of an adoption of this zero carbon emission policy and through a non-adoption of things like nuclear power fusion etc yeah you got the drones you got all this stuff so we face extinction now which means we have to one take on the policies that are going to get us through the current period but I would contend that the actual policy which will enable us to avoid the current extinction threat is the policy that comes out of taking on the long-range extinction threat, meaning the development of the kinds of technologies and infrastructure systems that allow us to deal with comets, you know, there's solar radiation, all this stuff, because that would mean developing fusion power, nuclear power, laser-based technology. That could drive an economic recovery today, get us out of the current crisis, and put us into a position where we're now able to start to take on and manage some of these much more long-range existential threats that we face. So, so let's leave it at that, and yeah, we can take some questions. Uh, well, you mentioned that our galaxy has about 300 billion stars. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It's that's possible. They could be having the same problems that we're having. There may be a Fridolina like the Rouge there. There may be other religions there with other languages. Yeah, it's a possibility. We don't know right now. But that's part of what that's part of the challenge. We want to get out there and figure this stuff out. Yeah. No, that's the thing. What are we going to do to make sure that we can find out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Possible. Well, I know there's life here on Earth. Yes. <laughs> Is there any other questions anyone has? Yeah. You mentioned the SDI program, right? Mm hmm. Is this what is the 
No, I mean, the thing that we've often pointed to is what really pissed people off with Clinton was whenever he gave this speech at the Council on Foreign Relations, where, I mean, I think it was known somewhat that he had some relationship to Lynn, to people around Lynn. He had some familiarity with Lynn's ideas. But he then gave this speech um, at the Council on Foreign Relations where he said, we have the worst financial crisis that we've seen in over 50 years and we need a new financial architecture. So he gives this speech in front of, you know, people are probably not real receptive to that kind of thinking, but he indicated that, one, he's aware, acknowledges the economic crisis, and two, we need a new financial architecture. So that was recognized like, hey, this guy's echoing to some extent what Lynn's been saying. You know, obviously he didn't get the crisis as with the depth that Lynn did, nor did he understand the solution with it. But he was, um, you know, he was reflecting that kind of thinking. And literally it was, we're talking within, I think, almost days maybe of that speech, the Lewinsky and everything else breaks, and boom, that shut him up. And, you know, so this coincided with other stuff that was going on, games that Gore was playing with the Russians and... Uh, other things, but yeah, I think that was part of, that kind of sealed the deal on Clinton in terms of them saying, yeah, we got to shut this guy up because this is, this is going too far. What is yeah. Oh, sorry. No, you go. Oh, oh. What is happening to Clinton now? You just mentioned, you know, he's, he's just been totally... Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's hard to say exactly what's going on. I mean, partly, I mean he's, a, he's a politician, but, but he has a lot of bad ideas, too. I mean, he's got a, a very, he's got a big environmentalist kick. Um, you know, who knows? He's also trying to sort of position things for Hillary to make a big run at the next election. Yeah, and then his, and then his daughter, you know, his daughter married a hedge fund manager, so that can't, <laughs> that can't help things around the dinner table. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, as... Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's a general who spent his whole life in the military. You would think that his experience and his opinion matters very much. Yeah. Well, that's the problem is you also have a lot of factions even within the military. Um, I mean, for example, the Air Force has tended to be, yeah, we've got the private military. But then the Air Force is kind of, it's a new, it's more, it has a new age kind of spin to it. Um, and that's a lot of where some of these policies come out of is those factions who do think with an, a kind of imperial bent, you know, which are much more aligned to the kind of strategic thinking that you find among the Anglo-Dutch Empire, the British Empire, than you do within the traditional military. Now, fortunately, you do have people like Dempsey, who, have, you know, who, does, seem to have, who does seem to be steeped, at least in some level of history, where he's warned about the, uh, was it the Thucydides problem of getting you know, sucked into a war and, and being destroyed that way. But yeah, you also have people who are part of these various types of think tanks and you know, people who are in the military themselves maybe have never even you know, shot a gun, right? Who just sit in these rooms and come up with these, these strategic doctrines for how to you know, dominate the world. Yeah, but so it's a, actually you know, their boots on yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a fight, it's a real fight. And um, you know, it's necessary, that's why it's necessary to get out there and educate more and more of the population and, you know, to really do what we can to bolster 
some of the better thinkers. You know, because unfortunately it's, you know, like Dempsey, he can, he's somewhat limited in what he can say publicly. I mean, he can't, you know, he has to have certain constraint. So I oftentimes, some of the... Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times the way these things work is you have some of the retired people who share the same mind as Dempsey who are a little more free to, to be vocal about really what they think. But yeah.